In this short video, we're going to talk about spring mass systems. It's an application of differential equations, which is extremely practical. We're going to look at the case first, where we have free undamped motion. So let's do a review of Hooke's law. Initially, you have a spring, which is not stretched. It has length L, and then you attach an object to it, some mass, and it stretches an additional S units. That's what we call the equilibrium position. So in this position, the force of gravity due to the mass is in balance with the force of the spring, which is trying to pull it back up. And we call this the equilibrium position or the rest position. So the force of the spring is a constant uh, times the length that it got stretched. That constant we call a spring constant. And in equilibrium, as we noted before, the force due to gravity is going to balance or be equal to the force due to the spring pulling it back up. Now, if we move the object from the equilibrium position, and in this model, we're going to consider down to be positive x, then the force of the spring, which we're pull the object back up again is still just going to be that same constant times the uh, distance the spring has been stretched. So let's go back to Newton's second law, which says that the sum of the forces acting on a body is going to be mass times acceleration. So acceleration is the second time derivative of x. And we know the force of the spring trying to pull it back up uh, is given by Hooke's law. And then the, so the weight of the object, is the force due to gravity, is trying to pull it down. Now, if I remove the parentheses, I'm going to have a negative ks. And I know that a negative ks plus mg, so ks is the same as mg. We discovered that from the rest position. So I'm only with left with negative k times x. So I'll divide through by m. And then for convenience, we're going to just rename the k over m as omega squared. So this e differential equation here describes what is known as free undamped um, motion or simple harmonic motion. So the result of this is going to show that the spring would oscillate forever. We know that's not true, but for short periods of time, uh, it's, this is a very good model. If we impose some initial conditions, um, so if we have, remember, down is positive in this uh, model. And so if we have uh, my initial position being positive, then we must have pulled the object down. It's, it starts below the rest position. And if I look at the first derivative, so the velocity, if that's negative, if I have a negative initial velocity, that means that it is being pushed upwards when it's released. All right, so let's try to solve this. Uh, our auxiliary equation is just m squared plus omega squared equals zero. Don't get confused. This is just our dummy variable that we use in the auxiliary equation. It does not represent mass. And so our solution is going to be uh, the sum of sines and cosines. Uh, so 
that would just indicate that yes it has this periodic motion it's just uh, moving back and forth in in the vertical direction and according again according to this model it does that forever some terminology associated with this um, our frequency um, uh, well let's just see. the omega here determines our frequency we're going to have to divide it by 2 pi the reciprocal frequency is the period so we're going to have 2 pi over omega and then there's this new term which you may or may not be familiar with called circular frequency uh, and that's what the omega is so the omega is the circular frequency it's without the divisor of 2 pi and the solution to this initial value problem is called the equation of motion now how important is this you say it's just such a simple model well if you think about it much more complex objects than a simple spring act like a simple spring so anything that has some sort of uh, flexibility or which could vibrate could act as a spring and so i've printed out here a this a small snippet of the output from a structural analysis program and which was used to analyze something complicated probably a car body and uh, these values the circular frequency and the frequency uh, are uh, so important that they're printed out and uh, you can see that there's not just one because it's a very complex object but still it's the same basic idea everything builds off this very simple spring mass model All right, so let's look at an example. Uh, we'll take the example one step at a time. So we have an object, it weighs two pounds, and it stretches a spring six inches. So that should be enough to use Hooke's law to determine the spring constant. At t equals zero, the mass is released from a point eight inches below the equilibrium position with an upward velocity of four fifths feet per second. So now we have our initial conditions and we're being asked to determine the equation of motion. So let's go ahead and use uh, Hooke's law. Before we do that, I want to make sure we're using consistent units. So our uh, acceleration due to gravity, our uh, initial velocity all use feet. So let's convert the two uh, quantities which were given to us in inches we'll convert those to feet and we're going to convert the pounds so the weight is the two pounds it's got to be converted to mass and how do you do that well, you take the weight and you divide by the acceleration of gravity uh, which we're taking to be 32 feet per second squared the unit of mass in the uh, this system of units is slug. So if you take your pounds and divide it by the acceleration due to gravity, the, you get 1 16th slugs. So we'd like to find the value of K using Hooke's law. And so uh, that just, remember this is at rest or at the equilibrium position. And that gives us k equals 4. And now we have our initial differential equation. And I can multiply through by 16. Get it in standard form. Take a look at our uh, auxiliary equation. And as expected, we're going to get an equation involving sine and cosine. We just need to determine the coefficients c1 and c2, or the parameters c1 and c2. So we know that uh, uh, the initial position is 2 thirds feet 
below the equilibrium position. And that tells us that the constant C1 should be 2 thirds. To impose the second initial condition, I need the derivative. And so the second initial condition says that it was uh, released with a velocity of uh, 4 fifths feet per second upward. That is going to mean that we have a negative initial velocity, because remember, downward is positive in this model. And so then we can calculate the value of C2. And there's our solution, the equation of motion. Now we may want to write this uh, in an alternate form as just a single sine function with this phase shift here, phi. And you can figure this formula out by just using the double angle, angle formula for sine. And so uh, the way that we would calculate it then uh, is the amplitude A is the square root of the sum of the squares of the coefficients on sine and cosine. Uh, to calculate phi, which is the phase angle, uh, we would use these equations here, which essentially tell us that the tangent of phi is C1 over C2. So for this particular problem, tangent of phi would be negative 20 over 3. But we have to be really careful when we pull out our calculator or other technology to calculate phi. My calculator, and I was, I was very careful, one of the things that you have to do is make sure your calculator is giving you an answer in radians, not degrees. And it says that uh, phi would be negative 1.422. And um, that is... Uh, correct because it's calculating the arctangent and arctangent is only defined between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. But this actual angle phi that we're trying to calculate which satisfies this equation uh, is not in the fourth quadrant. The angle that's given to you from the calculator is an angle in the fourth quadrant but sine of phi is positive, cosine of phi is negative. We're actually, the angle is actually in the second quadrant. So that's not a problem. Uh, what do you need to do? All you need to do is uh, add pi. You add pi, now you've got a uh, an angle in the uh, second quadrant. And so uh, after calculating the value of A, we can now write this equation of motion as uh, a function of the sine of this number, which is the circular frequency, and a phase shift. So you can have systems with multiple springs. We're going to look at two cases. Uh, one is where we have uh, oh, two case, two springs in parallel. And uh, really, the way that we want to handle these double spring systems is we want to determine what the effective spring constant is for the system of the two springs. And then you could actually just treat this as a single spring mass system using that effective spring constant. So it's fairly straightforward when you have springs acting in parallel. Uh, if you have springs acting in series, so you have one spring attached to another spring and then the object is attached to the end of the lower spring, uh, we have to think about that a little bit more uh, carefully. So. We're going to use x1 for the displacement of the first spring, x2 for the displacement of the second spring, and uh, so we have a total displacement of x. And what we need to think about here is that the restoring force of this system is 
uh, well, if you were to, for example, we're gonna assume these springs have negligible mass. If I were to just consider this uh, K2 plus the M as a new object, well, the restoring force would be just the spring constant K1 times X, or times X1, I'm sorry. And I could also consider this K1 to be part of the ceiling or whatever is, is uh, holding the springs, in which case the restoring force would be K2 times X2. And then if I want to uh, find the effective spring constant of this system, well then I would have that effective spring constant multiplied by the total displacement. So that's kind of an interesting thing. You're thinking about forces here. You have, to, you have to be very careful when you're looking at this with these equations. All of these equations represent forces. And so if I just use the fact that K1X1 should equal K2X2, I can uh, solve X1 in terms of X2. And then I need to do some algebra. And once I have that, I can go and replace uh, x1 by this expression with x2. And I'll set that equal to uh, k2 times x2. I'll work out the algebra and uh, find out that the effective spring constant for this system of two springs in serial is the product of K1 and K2 divided by the sum of K1 and K2. So I hope you found this uh, video useful. We're gonna look at several other cases where we make the system, the spring mass system more realistic, but then also more complicated.